a good way to contextualize your therapist is let's say you're a quarterback. The therapist is like a like a QB guru, like a trainer, like John Beck or something. So you're the guy in the mountains of Wyoming that has a 4,000 square foot facility that trains quarterbacks on how to use different arm angles or how to fall and not hurt yourself, how to have better hip mobility, how to how to have different launch points, how to put your foot in the ground and torque from your waist and throw a better pass. A therapist is nothing but an advisor. It's an advisor for your mental health, not just when things go wrong, because I think that's how we've come to think of therapy. Right. This is where I go, can I cuss? Yeah, for sure. I love that. How much can I cuss? Like, can how I cuss, much, cuss? Oh. How the fuck much do you want? I can say fuck. Say whatever the fuck you want. Oh, that shit, bro. You can say whatever the fuck you want, my nigga. <laughs> I feel like I'm home. All right, cool. But yeah, it's, it's, ah, oh, god damn, you told me I can cuss now. I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> Good to a ratio. Okay, though. Good to a ratio. Okay, though. That might be the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> You're a phenomenal person. I mean, you legendary. I am a fan of you, my brother. Keir Gaines is an amazing therapist who's done deep work into the mental health space and trying to understand what black and brown people need to feel really good about themselves. Therapy is a really amazing way to just explore who you are. You don't have to be in trauma and have something wrong to go to therapy. You can just be trying to figure out who you are and how to be a little bit happier. I wanted to talk to Kier about black mental health issues and we get into that somewhat, but this conversation goes all over the place because he starts therapizing me a little bit and it gets kind of deep. Let's get into it. It's Keir Gaines on Touré Show. So you're an expert in dealing with black men's mental health needs. Mm -hmm. And I want to zone in on that. Are there... Wait, are we live? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Are there specific things that specific challenges that black men have, because you're a licensed therapist, so you see all sorts of people Mm -hmm. and you are educated and experienced in dealing with all sorts of people. But what are the specific challenges that black men are dealing with? So many, let me see. The things that come to my mind automatically, um, hyper-independence, the idea that if I don't reach my goals by myself, And I don't know if this is just specific to black men, but I notice it in a different way in black men than I notice it. That um, we want to be hyper-independent. The desire to be hyper-independent based on what your environment tells you is correct growing up. So think about it. Like even dating prospects. Let's say you're a young man. You're 25 years old. You're working. You're doing your thing. You're single. But you live at home with your mom. With black men, it feels like that's a specific character indictment because there's an expectation that you reach your goals independent of the help of anyone else. So, for example, with a lot of black men, they'll come into the office and they'll say something like, yeah, I I had this problem. I was feeling really down. Uh, I just isolated myself a little bit, put my head down and just got to work. It's like, okay, well, who did you tell about your problems? Nah, nobody. Well, why didn't you tell anybody about your problems? I didn't want to be a burden. And then we will continue and we'll just keep reframing those thoughts so I can get an idea of what he means by being a burden. And it Mm kind of distills down into this idea that I don't want to have to depend on anybody for anything because if I do, then I am somehow less than a man. And that doesn't work. Y'all saw this Instagram video where this guy said, um, my, my son... If he graduates college and he doesn't have a job, I'll tell him to come home. If he's depressed and his mental health isn't good, I'll tell him to come home. If he loses his job, I'll tell him to come home. If his wife leaves him, I'll tell him to come home. I want my son to know that no matter what happens to him, he can always come home. Mm -hmm. And that's, he's still a whole person. He's still a man. He's still my baby. He needs to be here where he can get love and support. Mm -hmm. And that's just not something that I recognize 
in a lot of black men, even the desire to have that level of support for someone as an adult, because the expectation is you shouldn't have to do that. You should be able to stand on your own. If you can't get it yourself, then that means it's not for you to have. I noticed that. I feel like also we are supposed to be strong. Oh, yeah. Nothing bothers me. Not supposed to be depressed or sad or even knocked back. I know sometimes I've talked to brothers who are going through something and they're like, oh, I'm good. Yeah. I'm cool. I'm like, I know you're going through something. Like, ah, I'm good. I just got fired, divorced. Like, I'm good. Like, I'm like, we're always, you know, stiff upper lip. Mm -hmm. Nothing bothers me. And like, even I did it to my own dad because when his mom died and, uh, uh, and I was, I was like 10. I was like, is he going to cry? And my mom was like, he's not going to cry in front of you. Did he? No. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and in retrospect, I'm policing his ability to be emotional. Um, and like, it might have been a really great lesson for me because when he passed, I was sad, but I didn't cry. Did you feel a need? I'm not trying to therapize you. No, no, I'm not we trying to be therapized, <laughs> but it's part of the conversation. It's natural. Yeah, because I'm curious now, did you feel a desire to cry? Did you feel the emotion that was there that would lead to that action? I wasn't fighting it. I wasn't suppressing it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, it took me like, because it's like six, five, six days, whatever, between the passing and the funeral. Mm -hmm. It took me a couple of days, like at least 48 hours to realize, to fully realize, oh, this is happening to me. Cause it was like, oh, mom needs this, this, and this. I need to support my sister, this, yeah. this, and this way. They need the obit written. I know how to do that. I'll help. The, Keep da, da, da. yourself busy. Like, like, oh, you need the food, I'll get that. Yeah. I, and I wasn't trying to run from it, but, and then I remember sitting in a parking lot and be like, Yo, this is happening to you also. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. And like, I mean, he was quite old and he was not really in his body anymore. So I think I really said goodbye when he's still here, but I still didn't cry in the hospital uh, or the nursing home. But um, I was sad, but it never felt like I want to cry. And even at the funeral, I was like, it's so beautiful that you showed up and you showed up. And, um, but it was not, it was like, I could look outside of myself and say, I probably should cry at some point in this situation, but it's like, he's not gonna cry, but he feels sad. But but I've been trained as a black man, like, we strong. Yeah, I mean, whatever you get practice reps in, you're probably gonna be pretty good at. Mm -hmm. And around five or six, there's a lot of research and literature that suggests that boys, and I would imagine specifically black boys abandon that part of their humanity to get community from other little boys. And that's kind of where it starts. But I, I just got one more question about the crying thing. When did you cry? About that? Yeah. Oh, I never did. About my father passing. Um, he still, I still think about him and I am sad that he's not here to see this or that happen. But, um, I never teared up and cried about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, man. I mean, just, it makes me think about your earlier question. What do you see in black men in therapy? And I see a lot of black men in their grief space. And what happens to black men is because we've developed this scaffold, like just the schema of Americans, the way we look at black men, there's an expectation that we're going to withhold our emotions yeah. and we're going to have that level of stoicism, at least topically. Um, but not in everyone's grief process, they don't always express their emotions that way. Or sometimes you say he wasn't in his body anymore. Sometimes we have these mechanisms that allow us to accept death in a really specific way that maybe that's not the way we emote. Yeah. That's not the way we get that emotional expression off at all for a period of time. But when people think of grief, think of crying so I must be doing this wrong maybe I'm, am I supposed to cry right now there's a confusion is about it that necessary process. for me to cry in that situation I can't answer that I don't know I don't know because you're know. you're focused on like did you cry when did you cry mm -hmm. and I tell you it I didn't 
I, I was, felt sad, but I didn't cry. Is that okay? I don't think there's a good or a bad. I think as long as you find a healthy way to process the reality of that situation, to step into your body and realize, oh, this is happening to me too, to not um, other your problems. Oh, well, that's my mom's husband. Or, oh, my sister was way closer to my dad. So they're lost. Let me just be there for them in the moment because that's another reoccurring thing I see with black black men and black boys. Black boys, the expectation to be adultified way earlier mm. than you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, even in a lot of rap songs, you hear these, these boys who are from these urban communities say, I'm going to take care of you, mama. I'm going to buy you a house. It's my job to take care of you and I'm taking on the, the responsibilities house. of being a man before your mind is prepared to assume that role. It's a lot there, you know. So to your question, to answer your question, no, I don't. It's not good or bad that you didn't cry. It's a part of your process. If I were your therapist, I wouldn't be so stuck on the fact that you didn't cry. I would be more concerned on what healthy ways you're processing those emotions. So how do you memorialize your father? How do you think about him? How often are you telling stories about him? How often do you sit and reflect? on his life as it pertained to you and him as a whole completely different individual. Mm -hmm. You're just a portion of his life. That man was a completely, he was a whole person before you were born. For sure. Um, you know, how do you move through life accepting the reality of him not being here anymore? How does this new life look for you? You know, that type of yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, he had a whole child who's old enough to have a child around my age. Oh, wow. So he had a child very young. It's interesting because right before the pandemic, we, my sister and I went to dinner with her, our half-sister. And I'm like, I'm just here for the stories. I just want to hear the history. Because there was always a little whisper going around in the family that his dad was black. I'm white. Well, that his dad was white. Was it true? Well... I never, it was always said no. Mm -hmm. And then she said yes. Interesting. Because she's 20 years older than me. So she knows she got some things, intel, right? Yeah. She talked to people. My grandmother could talk to her about that, right? At her age, right? When I came around, it was too old to mm -hmm. talk about something. And she said yes, which was the first time that I knew that to be true. And it filled in some details of who he was as a real person. Um, and his life as opposed to, you know, the story that I got, you know. Um, so, yes, it, so the so the story of him was growing after uh, he was gone, which was interesting. That's, you want to know something fascinating about that I find in people's grief journeys? At some point, you may find out information about that person. That you didn't know. That you didn't know. And you may have to come to a point where you may have to forgive them or you may have to reconcile complicated feelings with a person who you can't have the conversation with. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't know. I'm good with that. I mean, I don't, you know, the thing, the thing I have gotten less now, but the first year, year and a half when he was gone, mm -hmm. that I would see him in the distance, somebody who had the same shape or the hat that he would wear or the color he was. And they were always like 50 yards away. And I'd be like, oh, there he is. And the mind is going, you know, that's not him. And the retinas are going, I know, uh -huh, but you yeah. but you see what I'm seeing, yeah, right? And yeah. the mind is like, I, I see it, but that does not make any sense. And like, but you, and then you blink. I mean, this is like a millisecond. And then you blink and you're like, well, clearly that's not him. Um, in the moments when that happens, do you feel it? Do you have a feeling in your body? Like, um. Like if you patch your pockets and you don't got your phone, yeah, yeah, you get a feeling in your body. Yeah. Do you have any type of feeling in your body when you used to see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't name it or describe it, but yeah, for sure, it was there. for sure. There's some feeling. Um, it's mostly a good feeling to be reminded of him. Is a good feeling. I learned in that experience. Every time someone says "I'm sorry," was nice. It felt nice, even if they didn't know him. Before that, I thought, what is the point of saying I'm sorry if I didn't know the person? Mm -hmm. And I real I, and any anybody, even they never met him, he said, I'm sorry for your like, thank you. That was nice. I didn't realize that. 
man, now you got me thinking about my own grief journey. Why you started that? <laughs> <laughs> because mine is, I lost my mom in 2004 mm. and after I graduated from high school. And I found myself actually avoiding the how's your mom, I'm so sorry thing. Because people don't know what to say. No, they don't. They're at a loss for words, and then they, they feel pressure, and they feel compelled to yeah. just put something on your heart. But like you're like the hundredth person I had this conversation with. It's not doing what you think it's doing. So now I found- Especially when you're 18? Yeah, you're yeah, 18? yeah, yeah, 18. I mean, that's young. It is. It is. But I've arrived to the place where I, I've learned that losing your parent at any age is always hard. It's just a different brand of hard. Yeah, I think for sure. I think, um, see, I was able to say to myself and to him, like, you had a full, long life, started in projects, you know, moved to the suburbs, ran a business, ran the course of that, like, saw, like, 80-some, you know, years, you know, you had a long life, saw your kids become adults. Like, if you pass in the middle of the story, she don't know what's gonna happen to her baby Kier. I know. Is he gonna make it? Yeah. He's promising, but who knows? You don't even know what your dreams are at that point. Mm. Nah, man. You're, that com would... you're a completely different person. Yeah. Yeah. It's something to think about. It's 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 life. I think just like you not crying, I've I've come to accept the reality. I, th I think the way that I deal with it is to look at it holistically. That's just the way my story went. That's the way her yeah. story went. But life continues to move on. I think racism is a big part of what black men have to deal with as far as their mental health. Is that what you find? I find that it's if if the world is an elevator in terms of black men and, and if black men's lives, put it like that, are elevated, I would say sometimes racism is that delightful little music playing in the stereo. <laughs> it's it's all, it be there in the background. You know, it's 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 ever so soft. It, it touches your life in ways that you don't always see or anticipate. But yeah, absolutely. I feel like sometimes it is emasculating or humbling racism in a way that we reject. It that does not align with how we think of ourselves. We think we're the shit, mm -hmm. right? Black men and ego. We all got the ego turned up. I am the man. I can do anything. And the racism undercuts that. And sometimes that leads to you think about yourself differently, but usually not. It usually you treat other people, especially women, worse. Oh, now you cooking. <laughs> now you you hitting on a whole nother conversation. Yeah, but I also want to make the distinction between ego, bravado, and self-confidence. Okay. Ain't the same thing. Okay. Like it's I think to put on an air to to have the desire to put out into the world that I am this thing. I am this unmessed withable, strong, independent, to be feared, to be respected, to be loved thing. I am a black man. This is this is what I am. That that's very different. I think self-confidence is a different thing because it says no matter what space I'm in, no matter how the people around me make me feel about myself. I have a pretty solid idea of who I am, what my value is to me, what I'm good at, what I like about myself, and where I accept myself. Not always self-love, because self-love is oversold. Not everyone's going to be able to love themselves in a traditional sense. And that's okay, because there's neutrality. You can have self-neutrality. It's, perfect, perfect, it's perfectly fine. I don't absolutely love these things about myself, but I don't hate them either. I'm, I'm okay with them. So, yeah, you can have the the ego and say, I'm the man, I'm right here. But if behind that ego isn't a sense of self-confidence that is driven by a grounded sense of self-awareness, it's, it's a house of cards. It's going to fall once it's tested hard enough. Mm, mm. And racism, I mean, it's interwoven into the fabric of this country. Yeah. It's, it's in the laws. It's in It's everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. if you don't have a strong sense of self-identity and self-confidence, I would guess that it will exasperate, you know, how quickly your ego or your sense of self can be deconstructed by these systems. I think there is more comfort or understanding of what therapy is and does, and it's like people don't look at it in a stigmatic way. Thank you for saying it. You're one of the first people to ever interview me 
that didn't start with, well, how can we get stigma. rid of the stigma of therapy? Right. Like, we've already done it a I lot. I think it's getting there. You hear oh, people absolutely. like Charlemagne be like, I can't wait to go to therapy. I love going to therapy. It doesn't mean you're in trouble, like you're building. Your... So we're getting there. So let's talk about how should, like, give me a user's guide. Like, how should I be using therapy as a person who's saying, I don't have this trauma that's, but you know, there's not a part of me that's bleeding psychologically, spiritually. Um, but you know, a lot of people go to therapy. They say it does a lot of things for them. So how should I be using therapy? What, how should I approach my therapist so that I can get a lot out of it? If you're listening to this and you're a football fan, I think a good way to contextualize your therapist is let's say you're a quarterback. Your therapist is like, a, like a QB guru, like a trainer, like John Beck or something. So you're the guy in the mountains of Wyoming that has a 4,000 square foot facility that trains quarterbacks on how to use different arm angles or how to fall and not hurt yourself, how to have better hip mobility, how to, how to have different launch points, how to put your foot in the ground and torque from your waist and throw a better pass. A therapist is nothing but an advisor. It's an advisor for your mental health, not just when things go wrong, because I think that's how we've come to think of therapy. Right. This is where I go. And can I cuss? Yeah, for sure. I love that. How much can I cuss? Like, how can much, I cuss, cuss? Oh, how the fuck much do you want to cuss? I can say fuck. Say whatever the fuck you want. Say that shit, bro. You can say yeah. whatever the fuck you want, my nigga. <laughs> I feel like I'm home. All right, cool. But yeah, it's... It's, ah, oh, God damn, you told me I can cuss now. I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? <laughs> you were talking about being a quarterback coach. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just something you do when all, the, when all the shit hits the fan and life is fucked up beyond all recognition. It's also something you do preliminarily. Hey, I'm in a point in my life that feels good right now, but I want to see a therapist to make sure I can stay on this track. Or I have a few small things that are bothering me in the back of my mind. I want to run this up against somebody who I know is not going to judge me and who can give me some helpful answers. Yeah. I think that's a good way to contextualize a therapist. Use it as another voice in the room who can hear what you say, who can see what you are and give you an objective opinion about, uh, give you an objective perspective rather of where they see you, where they see you going and what tools you can put in place to get to where you want to be. When I go to my session, should I have an idea? I want to talk about this. Let's work on this. Or should I just sit down and see what happens and just let the conversation <laughs> go where it goes? I think it depends. It depends on how your mind works. It depends on what you're going to therapy for. It depends on who your therapist is and how they work. You can come in. I, I would love if someone came in with a list of concerns that they have. Uh, it shows that you, you came in prepared, you're thinking about this, and there's some level of intentionality with this journey. I like that. But if you come in and you feel scatterbrained and you feel like it doesn't make sense, a lot of black men will stop talking to me and session like, man, that shit don't make no sense. I'm like, nah, you cooking, bro. Keep going. I understand what you're saying. Oh, man, I don't have the words for that. Do the best you can. I can pick up. You're doing well enough. Um, I think those things are really helpful. So, no, you don't have to have it all together. I mean, sometimes I'm like, something happened this week that I want to talk about, but then... Shouldn't I be working on like my inner child or the thing that happened when I was 12 that's still messing with me? That's that TikTok therapy. I mean, sometimes, yeah, we do dig into childhood to get some type of intel as to where some of these problems or some of these difficulties may have started. But sometimes we come in, you come in and we'll just talk about your day because it's not just... The, the root of the issue that we're always plucking at. Sometimes it's salient things. We can't get to the root if you're mentally and emotionally preoccupied with something that's burning a hole in the back of your skull with the argument you just had with your girl, right. with, with the way you're feeling incompetent as a parent because you yelled at your kid on the way to school this morning for spilling something. Mm, who so, does that? Yeah, <laughs> nobody, because we're all perfect parents. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, those it, it the thing that I think inhibits you from having a successful therapeutic alliance relationship and session is when you come in and you want to dictate as the client where we go and what we do because you have an idea of what you feel needs to be healed right and you're not you're not wrong in that but that might not be what i see in the moment and the exchange with a therapist and a client is it has to be trust yeah 
I need you to trust me that even though you want to come in and talk about how your dad wasn't shit, <laughs> right now we need to talk about this thing that you're feeling really insecure about at work because it's most salient. So in general, in your general understanding of, of black men, what do we need to do to be better men? Mm, that's such a profound question. Can you can you give it? Can you add some specificity, my brother? <laughs> like in terms of what? I mean, I think you are, as a therapist, you are. You have access to a different level of what black men are talking about mm -hmm. in terms of the folks you see and the reading you're dealing with. For sure. So, what can we do in general? I mean, I think there's things that black men are doing because of our culture, because of our specific history as husbands, as fathers. God, and, you know, I don't know if this is big different than white men, but somebody said to me once, everybody's like, I'm gonna be a better dad than my father, or I wanna live up to how good my father was. Mm -hmm. Does, do, do people say, I wanna be a great husband? Or I want to be a better husband. Like, yeah, they do. A lot of people yeah. don't say. I think a lot of people don't say that they have goals and aspirations for themselves as fathers, mm -hmm. but I think less so as husbands. But it is important to try to be a good husband. It is, and I think the husband, the the father goal, is more prominent than the husband goal. Is because you can feel as a as a man, you can feel where your father could have done more. Mm. where your father probably could have been there, where your father probably did too much and he could have done less. You have an idea of how that position affects you relationally. Mm. That don't exist. You, you've never had a husband before, bro. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you, you're Quite going fair, right? off yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so right. it's even steeped in idealisms. Mm. It, it's not based off of experience from a person who held that title and how it directly affected me. When things directly affect you, you move about it differently. You go to a Susan G. Komen walk, 90% of the people there have been affected by breast cancer in some way. Mm -hmm. We did a walk for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Shout out to them. Everybody there has been touched by suicide or suicide ideation in some way. Mm -hmm. People tend to gravitate toward things that affect their lives directly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a a perfect example of that. So, but what do we what do we need to do to be better husbands? What do we need to do to be better husbands? I mean, partly, partly, but we can get into this secondarily, but I mean, black men cheat on their wives more than any other demographic. Yeah, that's what the research says. Mm -hmm. That's what the research says. So, you know, <laughs> some of us are. Um, You know what? Let me back up. I'm not 100% sure if that's what the research says. No, it is. Okay, that's what the research says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, now I'm, I'm gonna have to trust you, my brother. Um, <laughs> that wasn't me trying to get out of it. That wasn't that was just me trying not to confirm something that I didn't read myself. Um, I think being a better husband is a subsection of being a better person. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us struggle with being a better person. Even when it comes to black men, I ride, I try to ride this fine line of holding you close and holding you accountable mm -hmm. because you ain't got to go far to hear that you ain't shit. Mm -hmm. But on the same token, you need a relatable face and voice to hold you to task. I think it's changing the ways that it's changing our relationship to sex and sexuality. Um, or examining our relationship with sex and sexuality more. It's finding ways or means of validation that don't include sex. Mm -hmm. um, I think being a better husband is about building community, community full of other men who are also husbands mm -hmm. and drawing from their experiences, allowing them, allowing yourself to be in a community of people you trust enough to tell you that you're doing something that isn't right and you don't just write that off as, oh, man, y'all y'all hating or y'all don't understand. They're in a similar situation. You can't just write their words off. You're actually forced to listen to them. Um, I think we absolutely, positively um, need to expand that. Man, this is going this is going to be tough for a lot of dudes. Your eyes open wide as Bring shit. It. Like, what is he about to say? Bring it. I think just in terms of male identity, mm -hmm. we have to expand what that means. What do you mean? Um how you present in the world mm -hmm. and what classifies you as a man. For example, I know some dudes now they get their fingernails painted. Mm -hmm. And there's arguments that you're not a man if you get your fingernails mm -hmm. painted. For it's a sure. very narrow definition of what a man yep. is. Yep. Um, I think that needs to expand and we need to put different things in the bucket of what being a man is. So 
if there's something that is non-threatening, you know, I if I'm a man, I gotta face the door the whole time because I never know when a threat's gonna come. Mm-hmm. I gotta be a threatening presence. I gotta be strong. If 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 we allow being non-threatening but still being powerful to be a part of the scheme of manhood or allow you to still feel masculine even though you're not the uh, most aggressive, biggest, scariest thing in the room, I think that allows for people to have character changes that are more flexible or people to be more, for men to be more accepting of the different parts of their personality. We as black men put so much value in your ability to seem threatening. Like if you seem tough and strong, deep voice and badass, and I think he would kick my ass or most men's ass. I respect him. Mm-hmm. He's he's a tough guy. Mm-hmm. I respect him. I think that's a nature brain mechanism. Even in nature, if you're a little scrawny lion and a, and a big ass lion with the nice silky mane come by, and his roar is deeper than yours, and his paws are bigger than yours, and his teeth are longer. You know the law of nature is if if I can beat your ass. <laughs> then there's not much you can really do to me or say to me. We got a society where we have equity, so it, your physical scariness only takes you so far. Right. My brain power can take me far to, further than my physicality and right. society, but I think that's a that's a natural brain mechanism for human beings. That's interesting. Bigger and scarier. You can secure more food. You're probably a, a stronger mate to succeed, uh, to have all your kids run through the line of succession with. What do you want to see us do to be better fathers? What do we need to do? I think it's hard to take someone to a place where you've never been. I think in order to be a better father, um, you have to learn how to control your guilt or learn to get a handle on your guilt. Guilt about what? Guilt about not being enough. Mm. Not being enough can prevent some men from even being in their kids' lives. Well, the example of a big part of the example of fatherhood that I was taught is dad works all the time to provide and take care of you. Mm-hmm. So to me, I'm working all the time is how I show you my love and I am able to provide. Mm-hmm. And are there times when maybe you should stop working and just play? That's maybe. But. The answer is yes, but that's a good example of opening up what it means to be a man in terms of identity. I go to work, I provide. That was dope as shit in 1964. Well, it's still essential to being a man, is it not? It is, but it's that plus now. That's not enough anymore. You have to have emotional awareness. You have to be able to, when your son falls down and he scrapes his knee in 1964, you probably tell him, get up, stiff up a yeah. lip. Now you got to get to his level. You have to have a conversation with him. You have to see how he feels. You have to follow up. 1964, your son gets too wordy. You might smack him in the mouth. Did you get hit? Nah, I didn't get hit. I mean, I, I got did. three ass whoopers my whole life. I got hit a lot. <laughs> For real? And I, I think about- I want to ask about that because there's what so, you many, ask. Just so many different perspectives. Do you, do you feel like it was helpful to you? No, no. Because I now see that I was mostly being moody, right? I think I had like just moody, young mm-hmm. artist, chemical, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just down right now. So maybe I was- little a little rude or a little talk backy or whatever i was never a bad kid i was never mm-hmm. disrespectful but like you know my mood is here now and i got in trouble for that and i'm talking like three four five years old i had no ability to modulate what i was being spanked for Mm-mm. so i would love to not do the things that get me spanked but i cannot control so I mean, I just hope that the weather goes this way and I don't get spanked today. But like, you know, it doesn't, and the spanking is not going to prevent me from doing it tomorrow because this is who I am at three, four, five, maybe six. And there's no course correction behind that sometimes. There's no no restorative conversation. Mm. There's no, and I ask people because, you know, in the black community, ass whipping was a religion at some point. For sure. And folks have different ideas and of if, how helpful that was. And if you them. don't spank, you are spoiling the child. Oh, absolutely. That, Cause crazy. you know that's what's wrong with Generation Alpha, right? Right. All these kids, they're not getting enough ass whoopings. The thing that I the thing I tell people all the time when they think that is when you did get a whipping, who was the whipping for? Was it for you to have changed behavior? 
or was it for them? And if you don't know the answer, mm. or if the answer was it was for you, how could you tell the difference between you getting your ass whooped because you did something bad versus you getting the ass, your ass whooped because your, your dad was made to feel small mm. in society that day, mm. and you're the smallest, weakest person in the house, and you can't. What you going to do to defend yourself? Mm. Or what if they you did something to remind them or make them think that they're not a good enough parent? And what you got was the rage. It wasn't for corrective action or anything like that. Mm. It wasn't to help you be a different person. How can you tell the difference between them exercising and venting their frustrations on the smallest, weakest person in the house with the smallest voice versus them doing something for your long-term benefit? Mm. How do you how do you make the distinction between those two things? Well, I mean, as soon as you start getting spanked, you are you are in fear and peril, and you can't learn when you're in peril and fear. You talk about emotional awareness. It seems hard as a black man to learn and uh, act on emotional awareness because most other men around you don't want to hear about it. And a lot of the women in your life will police you for being it. like For being emotionally aware or for not being emotionally aware? No, no, aware. for being emotionally aware. You're too emotional. Oh, yeah, 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 hear, for sure. They yeah. don't want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. You're sad or whatever. You're like, oh, I don't want to hear all that. Like, you're going to be there for me when I'm sad. But don't be a whole person with your own feelings and shit. I mean, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To say nothing of it's constantly mocked in commercials. Mm -hmm. The guy who is sad or whatever is constantly the butt of joke, of a joke in a commercial or a TV show, whatever. But the women in our lives will say they want it, and then when they get it, they're like, mm, I don't know if I want to deal with you sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, something, it's different drawing a picture of what you want out of somebody in your head versus what it looks like when they bring it to you with their worldview and their stuff, and you got to deal with it right then and there. Uh, yeah, that that is a tough one because the, the emotional expression of, because there's the emotion, the thing that you feel, and then there's emotional expression, which is the way it comes out. And sometimes with black men, we only feel comfortable with a, a shortened menu list of emotional expressions. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it gets mocked that way, that's negative reinforcement, bro. Your brain is being taught that when you do this thing, negative things happen. So next time, I'm going to do this thing less. And if that happens one, five, ten... 20 times throughout the course of your life, it changes your personality and it changes the level of comfort you have, even within yourself to express those emotions to other people, especially somebody you're romantically dating. Mm. Mm. <laughs> like, would you, like, who would want to appear weaker and less of w how they see themselves? But it's natural and it's, it's, it's comfortable. It's allowed for her to say, I feel weak, comfort me. Listen to me, right? Tell me it's going to be okay. Okay, I'll do that. But every once in a while, I'm like, yo, I feel nervous about life. I'm scared. Can I show that to you? Like, a lot of women are like, mm, I don't want to see that. <laughs> or I'm upset with you about X. I don't want to yeah. hear about that. It breaks the glass of, of what we perceive a man to be. It breaks mm. the fourth wall. It, yeah, I I personally, I've experienced it a few times in my life, thankfully. My wife is not like that, man. I can I can burst out into tears around this woman, and I'm I'm, I'm no less of a man. It's it's rare, but I, I definitely found it. Um <sighs> it's so hard to start with that because the conversation between when we talk about men and women is just such a it's an odd differential there, like a social differential. I look at men and women as two completely different cultures. Okay. Two completely different cultures. Okay. And in cultures, what typically happens is you typically, you tend to be more comfortable demonstrating the behaviors that are accepted within that culture. So mm -hmm. if I'm a woman and I run on my homegirls, I'm like, so Ray did it again. I'm like, he, he's messing up. I think this relationship is over. Okay, don't put that in the world. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> it's a hypothetical. Try to make it, it's a try to make it real to where we at. Okay, but yeah, all right. So Bob, all right, we're not going to do it today. We're going to say Bob. Bob messing up again. She's more likely to get empathetic support from the communities that she's a member of. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. men not so much. Mm-hmm. And it's just like you the behaviors, if that's not acceptable in your community, you're going to do it much less. And then in turn, men just don't really get the practice of saying to a group of loved ones, hey, yeah, I'm 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 not good right now. All these things happen. I think it's my fault. You know, you got you got your homie in a group chat who got a wife and two kids. He's gonna say, damn, bro, that's crazy. I hope you figure that out. You know, your young homies who are still in the streets dating and having a good time might be like, damn, man, hey, I'm here if you need me. They don't, much like the death thing, they don't always know what to say or how to comfort you. So you're trying to get something from a group of people who don't have experience getting that thing or giving it to people. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. like, it's it's cyclical. It's hard. Cyclically nothing. Is it necessary, is it valuable to have a black therapist as a black person or such a good question. Does it not matter? What, what do you think? Before I answer, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know. My therapy journey, uh, I've had both, and I didn't necessarily, I did not feel like, oh, with the black therapist, I'm like, we're right on a level, so we can get, the, like, I just didn't feel that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is the dream. That is the imagination of what will happen. Socially, I connect with black people much more easily, mm-hmm. right? Like I see it at the gym. I can walk up to any black person and be like, yo, what's good? We might have a conversation, might just bump fist, but like, I mean, like all the black people at the gym are like, we are touching base with each other at some point. Say, white people, it's much harder or trickier to become. For some, I have some gym friends, right? But it's just, it takes a little bit more work mm-hmm. with the white people. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the expectation in general, I would think, uh, that I'm gonna bond with the black therapist more quickly and we get deeper, faster. That has not necessarily been my experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I do not want to be in therapy explaining racism to somebody. That's, that, that's that would kill me. the thing. That it's, would kill me. It's the shared experiences. So the answer is, it depends. Mm-hmm. It depends. Personally, I I think, your therapist doesn't need to be black because you're black to be effective. Your therapist mm-hmm. needs to be effective and have cultural competency. Right. But there is something to be said for not having to explain to someone in a room why I feel a certain way because being a tall black man means if I'm walking behind somebody on the sidewalk, they either look like they're in fear, I have to cross the street, I have to be so situationally aware of what my body's doing and where it is in proximity to other folks that it's exhausting. Another black man will understand that more than somebody who hasn't been in this type of body yeah. or been in this experience. But there's a caveat. It's this thing called assumed similarity. Mm-hmm. And assumed similarity says, because you're a black man and I'm a black man, when you come to therapy and you talk to me, because I lived in this experience, the things that you don't tell me or the things you haven't told me yet or the things we've yet to discover, I fill them in with my own experience. I assume because we have similar ancestry that we have shared experiences. And that's not always true. So I make assumptions about you as a black man based on my concept of black men, that's a, not who you actually are. That's a bias that's coming from the therapist. Oh, 100%. Not from me. Not no, from the client. Not in, not in this instance. It's coming from the therapist. Right. So mm-hmm. that the, And I mean, see, there is a danger in that because you may be assuming X, Y, and Z, so I don't have to verbalize them because you're like, yeah, I understand how racism affects you. And part of the thing is just verbalizing things. Sometimes I'm like, I didn't do any work, but I talked about this, this, and this, and I feel better. Or I don't know how racism affects you. I'm assuming I do because I know how racism affects me, Mm. and I know how it affects black men generally. That's not the same thing. It's not, although, although if I had a white therapist who was asking certain questions about racism, as in like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That would bother me. Like, I mean, and my friends, if a white person, white person can ask me certain questions about racism, but there are certain other questions that like, okay, you're too rudimentary Mm -hmm. for me to be close to you. Like you gotta have some, you gotta come to me with some competency, some understanding, right? I don't want you to fucking tell me you read the new Jim Crow. <laughs> oh my God. But I, I want to that. know that you understand. What was the joints when the Democrats took a knee in the Capitol Oh voters? God, please don't do that. <laughs> with the Kente cloth. <laughs> oh, but man. just having a yeah. general fluency of like, 
I do understand that racism is real, mm-hmm. right? That white privilege is real. Like, you know, let's talk about life. Great. But if I have to prove to like, well, how do you know that it was racist when the cop shot the kid? I'm with like, you. I'm with you. I'm with you. That's a barrier, I think. And that's the part where I say it depends because it also depends on your own level of comfort and your life and your lived experiences. If you already walk in thinking that this person who is not black, who is not a man, is is going to probably either kick information back to me that isn't true to what I gave them or completely misunderstand me, I think you're already starting at a little bit of a disadvantage in that therapeutic alliance. So if you do not trust that that white therapist will have the understanding and the cultural competency to meet you where you are, then I think it'll probably be a better idea to look for a black therapist. I mean, I don't think that I've talked a lot about racism in therapy. I I don't think I ever have. Yeah, I don't think, I don't know that I need that place to to deal with me on that. I'm talking about many other things. Mm -hmm. But then there are some people, like I have a lot of um, black female clients and with black women, it's that it's that intersection. It's racism and sexism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes they need someone who understands those junctions very intimately. Help us understand, as black men, what do the sisters in general say they want more or less from us? It's, for, let me just say, I am not speaking on behalf of black women. No, <laughs> just from your research yeah, and experience. It's, it's so... It's so it's so diverse because they're the things topically that people say they want. We want provider, we want protector. That means so much that it actually means nothing in specific context. So that's what I'm hearing. We want we want men who have a desire to be head of household, be head of family, but we also want men that understand that women are leaders too. Mm-hmm. And we want men to understand the power of equity, the power of share of voice in a relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, I think those are some of the more deep things that women are saying they want. They want a, a man who can understand the difference between being a leader and a dictator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. They want a, a man who is going to be a good partner and a good person to them. You kind of keep saying the same thing. It's cyclical. Everyone thinks leading, it, but also listening. Yeah, sharing though. You're kind of in charge, but you let me be in charge too, right? Like leader, but not dictator. But a leader is in service and is also understanding. Like, well, she's also leading, mm-hmm. and which which is a hard line to strike because leadership isn't an intrinsic skill. Right. Some people have have. Um, just by birth, they have competencies that'll make them stronger leaders, but leadership is usually a skill that you learn over time. It's not something you're born with. And even that's counterintuitive to say that by virtue of being a man, that doesn't mean that you should be a leader, you shouldn't be powerful. But expecting a man by virtue of being a man to be powerful and be a leader, it's it, it just these priorities compete and they crash up into each other all the time. Uh, it, if you're trying to make sense of it, brother, I would stop because <laughs> because what we ask of women don't make sense either. Like what humans ask of each other romantically is preposterous sometimes. No, I know. I know. I need you to be my best friend, yep. my sexual partner, my co-parenting partner, mm-hmm. my co-business manager for mm-hmm. the corporation that is me and you. Mm-hmm. Um, and also... I need you to be uh, a social, spiritual, and and let's say cultural fit for me when I'm around 30 and when I'm around 45, 50, when I may have changed, right? And we maybe we walk the same path, but like I may have developed different things that I'm mm-hmm. interested in than you are, but we still got to be really close. Of course. And that's just the shit she does for you. She ain't even start working on herself yet. Right. Yeah. That's That's just the part of... Her that has some tie to you. That's not the part of her that may be a mom, the part of her that may be a professional, the part of her that has grown in the last 20 years. She doesn't like the same thing. She doesn't have the same goals. One difficult thing for me that I think I got through, because before we had kids, right, like I was her guy. I was the center of her world, right? 
oh, we do, we go over this a lot in therapy. Please give it to me. And then, you know, having the baby, well, being pregnant and having the baby, you are displaced. Mm -hmm. You are no longer the sun. You are the moon and the baby is the sun. Mm -hmm. And you love the baby too. Oh, no doubt. But her entire focus is everything for the baby. From to sun up to sundown, it's all about whatever the baby needs. And that's great. But at some point, you're also like, well, I used to get, you know, you have been displaced. You are no longer number one in her heart. And you will never again be number one in her heart. And it's hard. It is. And that's where a lot of resentment comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of resentment comes in. I always recommend uh, men who, whether you're married or not, if you're about to have a baby, if a baby is about to land into this world that has your DNA in it, I think you need to go to therapy. It's a lot to reconcile with. Being a partner, when the partnership used to just be about the two of you all and it's not anymore. Being a partner to someone who's going through pregnancy, that's a lot. That's not a fair relationship. <laughs> it's not fair anymore. Well, I mean, the power balance changes because oh, yeah. maybe when you're just the two of you, you know, maybe you get the, the right of way. You know, she lets you have the decisions a lot of times. It's culturally, that happens a lot. But- after the baby comes, she, everything she's thinking is what the baby needs. Mm -hmm. So she's like, "Every we're doing everything that I say because it, I'm thinking about what the baby needs. So are we going to go see, you know, my mother or whatever? Like, yes, no, because I can take the baby there and I need this. No, I cannot deal with an hour long journey there. So we're not going like whatever it may be, um, which is not wrong. But I'm just saying that there's a cultural way you have to adjust within your household. Yeah, several different times over. And even in that instance, uh, a lot of thing, a lot of the work that we do sometimes is teaching men how to stand up for themselves, mm -hmm. how to advocate for themselves in those situations um, without being, um, I don't know why the word's escaping me. It's not provocative, uh, but without being confrontational. So saying something like, babe, it's okay if I like something different than you do. We don't have to like the same thing. Mm -hmm. Or babe, it's okay if I have different priorities than you do. You can have those priorities. I don't feel the exact the same exact way right now. Mm. Caveat, don't just go randomly saying that to your pregnant significant other. Which camera <laughs> hot? Don't go randomly saying that shit. It's that yeah, don't 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 say the therapist on the Toray show told me to not don't don't do At the that. Right time. Right time. It, you got I don't know what happened to your relationship before. It's a lot of factors there. But it could build resentment because motherhood in that process comes and becomes a part of her identity before fatherhood becomes a part of yours. It sure does. And it's even true. when fatherhood becomes a part of your identity, it's in a very different way. Mm -hmm. It's in a very different way. Um, yeah, man, that's such a, oh, these young men. I used to counsel these men in the community who had a girlfriend and they're young and they got pregnant. And I just used to watch everybody say, boy, you need to take care of that baby. You better take care of that girl. You better take care of this. You better not do this. You better. I'm like, yo, where's his encouragement to take care of himself? Mm. And we asking like how, that's why it's so hard for me to answer the question, what can black men do better? Because I see, I get it. I, I get that. But we don't have a conversation of what happened to little black boys. We don't have a conversation what happened to black boys who are preteens. Junior high school is notorious, what is it called, middle school now? It's notoriously difficult for young black boys. There's evidence that suggests that young black boys have a harder time in the education setting. There's, suggest, there's evidence that suggests that little black boys have harder times regulating their emotions. They don't get any special treatment. They don't get anything different. It's They get the same thing as everyone else, even though those needs are very different. So sometimes we mature into men that don't exactly know how to be the husband and the father and the partner and to navigate all of these ever-changing situations and circumstances that require you to be a different part of yourself in order to be effective. Mm -hmm. You can't be the same you at work that you are at home with the kids. You're not the same exact you when it's you and, and the lady out on date night and versus when it's all of y'all with the family. Or how about this young man? We're putting these expectations on him. He doesn't know that your relationship with your girl is one thing. Your relationship with your child is another. Your relationship between 
between you, your girl, and your child is another. Your relationship between your girl and your child is another. They may have conflict sometimes that you may have to step in between and mediate and vice versa. So it's it's a lot of expectations without the reminder to be present for self or take care of self. It's expectation for you to continuously self-abnegate and not really come across this moment of conflict where you say, well, why am I doing all of Never wonder why you're the one supporting her through her postpartum journey, but where's her mom? Where's her sisters? Where's her aunt? Where's your mom? Where's your sisters? Mm. You're never going to be enough by yourself, bro. It's not even an indictment on you. It's just that journey is rough. I know I ain't got to tell you that. I think I think, I think, think fewer people are saying, therapy is some white shit. But I think there are still people who are like, therapy is some white shit. They don't do therapy in Africa. <laughs> they don't do therapy in Africa. That's what they would say, right? That's, that's some white man shit. Like, ah, nah, come that's on now. that's that's crazy. I, I'm sure there are people out there that still believe that. That still believe that. And look, you know, there are people who've had horrible experiences with mental health professionals, um, and that has colored the the lens through which they see the mental health feel all together, and it's turned them off. And I can understand that. Um, but regardless of how you feel about therapy, if you think therapy is bullshit, that's one thing. But if you are in the need of help and assistance and you can't gain control of your mental health faculties and your life is spinning out of control, it's not about being a white thing. It's not about not being manly. It's about you receiving some care. But not even the edge cases, your life is spinning out of control. I feel okay. I don't, I don't think that I have significant trauma inside me right i'm I'm not mentally bleeding Mm -hmm. but i'm going to therapy because i think it could be helpful Mm -hmm. and like you know it doesn't mean i'm trying to deal with something that's driving me nuts i like talking to somebody about my stuff and seeing how i can see it differently and see myself better I think that's a beautiful perspective. I don't know how common that is, though. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, like to the to the let's say the average black man who's like, I'm fine. I have no significant traumas. Why would I be in therapy? It's the analogy I use is that um, I don't just go see a mechanic once my engine blows up, right? Or I don't always go and see the mechanic when my check engine light goes off. Right. There's certain milestones in my car's life where I know I'm going to need maintenance on it. Now, keep in mind that's very tangible. You can see the thread on the, the tread on tires disappear. You can take your dipstick and you can see shards of black dust where oil is supposed to be. Uh. You can physically see those things. But when you're dealing with life and you're taking care of your mom and your sisters and you're going to work and you're working out and all these things that distract you from, you know what I'm saying, the main thing, uh, it's it's a lot easier not to see that. So yeah, it's of of course you don't have to wait until your life is spinning out of control to go to therapy, but I'm just not sure if everyone has um the sensitivity like an emotional threshold where they can see life that way. You see a therapist? Yeah. Actually, I'm in between therapists right now. It's yeah. hard for me to find a therapist. Why? Um so not all I think it's a lot of different reasons. I've, when some therapists find out I'm a therapist, it's like, oh God, finally someone who understands. And then it turns into a joint therapy session, which I don't enjoy because I'm there to talk about me. Yeah. And it becomes about the both of them. Because therapists are humans. And sometimes they accumulate experiences and thoughts that they don't have, and they don't have anyone to bounce it off of. And when you get in the room, they can see that in you. And it's like, ah, so now we're talking about your life. That doesn't really work for me. Um or if there are women who have had bad experiences with black men uh, and who have developed an understanding of black men to be emotionally immature or uh, just overall emotionally unhealthy, they'll see me and be like, oh, he's so different. And they become enamored by how different I am than the other men in their life. And they don't push me as much anymore. They just, oh, keep going, black man. You, Oh, you're in a relationship. You don't cheat on your wife. Oh, keep going, black man. Oh, you ride bikes with your daughter? Keep going, black man. I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but I got some shit I'm dealing with. I need you to... No, 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 you're doing fine. That's not helpful to me. Mm. So it's hard to find a therapist. I need somebody who's not impressed by me at all. Or once they follow my social media page, then it changes. 
I need somebody who don't give a damn about any of that, and we can just get to the stuff. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is, man. It's a rough you know, journey. I, I used to, I asked some people come on the show, because I think that deep down, mm. the bottom of your emotional well, most people are sad, angry, or scared. Okay, I can agree to that. Right? Mm -hmm. Most that's most people at the bottom of the world are not like, yay, they're either sad, angry, or scared. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, so first of oh, all, yeah. as a therapist, you agree with that concept? With these caveats. One, they oscillate between all three of those feelings at different times and spaces. And two, sad, angry, and scared aren't the only three feelings they feel. They, they have other emotions that fall. What else that. do you think? Because I feel like most people, when they get to the bottom of it, they're sad about life or something, or they're afraid of something. They're sad. Or they're angry, angry about something. Like, what is, the, what is really down there at the bottom? I feel like I'm scared. Like, scared that, like, you know, things will mess up. And I, I sure, I tell, I'm scared. I'm, I'm end up homeless. At this age, IRA, all the things. I'm like, oh, shit. But I see a homeless person, and I'd be like, oh shit, that's about to be me if I don't get my shit together. Right? No, no. Like, like, like. I'm, I see a homeless person. And I want to count. Like, yo, you got this. You got this. You're okay. Are you good? You're good. You're good. You're good. You, you're good. You, you know what? I, I take that back. Let's. We can roll with those three because now that I'm thinking the other emotions. I think they are derived from anger. Yeah, or fear, fear or yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you, so you, you dig this concept? Yeah, because even shame and guilt can be traced back down to anger. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, what is it for you? My mains. What at the very bottom of my well? Mm -hmm. Oh, not so much anger. I think resentment sometimes, which I think resentment sometimes, and I think fear, man. I grew up, I grew up broke. Like I grew up in the projects of DC. Um, I mean, the roaches and the mice were so bad in my apartment growing up, man. I, I was afraid to have company. Where were y'all? So I lived in a quadrant of DC called Southeast, mm -hmm. and it's two notorious neighborhoods in Southeast. One is called Simple City. I lived on Forty Six and G. And another one's called 37th Street, and the name is self-explanatory. Um, and those neighborhoods, man, they just they weren't good for the emotional development, bruh. A lot of fighting, a lot of violence, like a lot of drugs, a lot of poverty. You had to fight a lot? At first, yeah. Yeah. My mom was passive. So she we got to the this we for the first neighborhood we lived in was bad, but I lived in my whole life. Then we had a house fire when I was nine, and the housing authority just put us in a random neighborhood. And I remember when we were driving, I was like, please don't turn up this hill because I went to a summer camp and kids lived in this neighborhood. And I was like, damn, it's bad where I'm at, but it ain't this. And then we moved there. And I was there for nine years until I moved out and got my own apartment after my mom passed. And when I first got to the neighborhood, you the new kid in the neighborhood, everybody tried you. Especially, I was taller. You know, I was in the science and shit. I wasn't, I wasn't no gangster, man. I like music and science. I got to the neighborhood and you realize that those kids didn't come from the same household that I came from. And sometimes you open your mouth and if you say a word that's bigger than what they can comprehend, a fist coming next. Wait, what? Yeah, you so let's, let's a, a word bigger than they could comprehend yeah. and they would just punch you in the face? Uh, it's happened before, absolutely. And then you learn that, okay, well, my mom says don't hit y'all back, but these all this fighting and the gun pulling, it doesn't stop. So the next time somebody comes at me, before he has a chance to get too aggressive, I'm going to hit him in his mouth first. And man, you get some positive feedback from that. Come to Thank find you. out, who knew? When you punch a kid in his mouth yeah, first, but he respects you. They don't play with you the same way. And it's yeah, like, look oh. up to you now. Okay, you tough. Okay, 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 you got it. You got it. You got it. But that tool, what I learned, and a lot of men carry this too, that tool is very useful for you for a very small period of time. Yeah. But then you take it in the other parts of your manhood and it don't really work no, that no, well. You can't punch people in the face in your real life. The bouncer won't let me in the club because my ID expired. Everybody move out the way real quick. Like, it doesn't work quite you that way. You me that scene from the 40-year-old virgin when Kevin Hart was in the store trying to buy a TV. Oh, yeah, I and, need you to be and, my nigga. Like, and, yeah, right. And he's like, now you use big words. Words, <laughs> big words. I don't know what they mean, so I'm going to take yeah. them with disrespect. Watch your mouth. It's crazy, bro. You don't even say nothing. 
But that's how it is. That's a beautiful. That's that's emblematic of how it works in those neighborhoods, man. I can't understand what you're saying, so I'm gonna take that as disrespectful. Even I don't know if you remember Jay Z said that line that dudes used to be real aggressive in his neighborhood, yeah. and he realized, oh y'all scared because I see you, and you don't want to be seen. I see the real you that's scared, and you think I see you, so you're getting aggressive to throw me off your throw me off your scent. You know, I. I... I did a whole thing on Jay. I did a bunch of things on Jay, but I did a whole big cover story on him. And really digging into his psyche, I've really figured out something like almost therapizing oh, him. Oh, yeah, give it to me, man. Because he's- I think he's a fascinating dude. Very much so, mm -hmm. right? And he, especially the first six, seven, eight years of his career, is like mm -hmm. he's the coolest dude out, right? He's icy, right? He's chill. And I don't mean jewelry. I mean like emotionally icy, he's chill. And we started talking about his life and he looked up to his dad like Superman. Yeah. And when he was around 10, his uncle, Jay's uncle got shot and killed. And his dad kind of went into the street looking for that guy to get him back. And in that, he kind of leaves the family. And Jay was crushed. Superman has left the home and he was so hurt. He's like, I never want to be this hurt again. So he kind of locks up his heart. Oh, the protective shell. And no one will ever be able to hurt me again because I'm never going to love or care about anyone enough to let them hurt me. By the way, another theme that I noticed with Black Men in Therapy, but please continue. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So then it's like, oh, what I read as your cool pose is actually you hiding your emotions and hiding behind a sort of mask. And I'm like, oh, he's mad cool. Like... Well, yes, he is, but also he's retreated so that he's never so engaged that you could hurt him. Being self-protective. Yeah, man. Yeah. And we do that a lot. Oh, yeah. I think about Jay-Z sometimes because I think about the time between his first album and his second. Okay. And when you listen to Reasonable Doubt, it's like, all right, you get a feel for him. But then you listen to the next couple of albums in succession, and the things that he talk about are expanded. You could tell he went out and saw the world a little bit. Yeah. He realized that the world was bigger than just Brooklyn. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I can't imagine you having that much of a change in your life and then still being entrenched in all these circles where maybe people don't have that same intellectual change yeah. or that same intellectual blow up and you still navigating all these different worlds, carrying with you pain like when your dad left or when you feel like you had to hustle super hard in Virginia in order to make a name for yourself. That's a lot to carry, bro. That's a, And I don't know if that goes away because you become a billionaire. Mm -mm. Mm. You know, this was early in his relationship with Beyonce. And was this early 2000? Something like that. Yeah. Don't, don't quiz me on the date, but something I, like that. Something loosely, like that. yeah. And um, you know what I'll tell you? One of the one of the days that I was hanging out with him, he played Takeover for me before it was out. You oh man. So that's that but I was like, you gonna bleep out the names, right? And he was like, he looked at me like I was crazy. I'm like, no, nigga. This is this is what it is. We go to war. Like, oh <laughs> that, shit. Uh, so that'll tell you when it when it was. Um I got so many questions, but I don't want to derail you. No, you can go with it, but be but his relation with Beyonce was newer. Mm -hmm. And even in that, he kind of indicated like, you know. I'm I'm hiding my heart a little bit. And he didn't let the world know fully about, like there was a time when he's like, I don't talk about Beyonce, right? There was an interviewer in England who tried to ask him and he went silent right there on the couch. But he was like, we don't talk about Beyonce, right? And now it's like, I love her, we together, I'm defending her on the stage and whatever. Um, but he was hiding his heart because he didn't want all of us to know. I think he was worried. If, if some if this breaks up, I'm look like a fool, right? He says the way he asked her to date him was, "Don't make me look stupid." Another thing, remember with, that? Well, yeah, but another thing with black men in therapy, looking like a bitch or looking stupid. That's that, a that that's we, a big recurring. Mm, mm. You bring as you talking, you're bringing these things up in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you wanted to ask take me. over. What's the first thing you thought when you heard that joint? I can't believe you're saying their names. <laughs> Because a lot of rap beef is yeah. subliminal. We kind of know what you're saying. They definitely know, but you didn't say the name. So this was bringing like, yo, you're going against Mob Deep and not not that he would lose, but just like you're 
really saying their name. You're gonna bleep out their names. But also, the song is hot to death. First this time I heard that fire. Jam, I, I replayed it like eight times. I could not believe my ears just absorbed that. Yeah. What? I remember. I remember very well. That's crazy. That's a crazy story. For sure. For sure. I think about DC, and I ask this sometimes to people who really know DC. You really, really from DC. Yeah. Because every city with a significant black population has a significant hip hop scene. Like they've created national rappers. Mm-hmm. You know what it is, New York, the mm-hmm. Bay, Chicago, Even Memphis, LA, Atlanta, Memphis, mm-hmm. New Orleans, mm-hmm. Detroit. Yeah, Detroit has an exploding hip hop scene right Where now. Where is DC? DC has not really spoken to the country about this. And when there's a crime scene, there's always somebody who's going to rise up, be like, I know what that is. I'm from that. Let me tell you what that life is like. Where is DC? I got a couple theories. So I think with a lot of these homegrown artists, they're able to gain traction in a significant following in their local city. For sure. Yeah, you got to Because local. with that population, yeah. hip hop music is probably the most popular genre of music. Okay. Until recently, the most popular genre of music in DC was not hip hop. It was go-go. So if you ask somebody in D.C. who's your favorite D.C. rapper, they're not going to tell you a lot of the local rappers unless they're on the scene. By the way, I used to rap. and I used to be on the scene super hard. Okay. But they, the guys who are in the open mics, you're probably not going to hear from them that much. They'll be able to tell you Wale is from D.C. Or maybe now they'll tell you, uh, and these guys aren't really from D.C. I think they're from PG County, like a Gold Link or um, it's a few of these guys who are out here now, but- their music didn't explode in the city to the point where we were playing it going yeah. up and down the street. We were playing Go Go, TCB, Junkyard, Backyard, XIB, CCB. It's weird because it's the only big city that has another scene that had it on lock and hip hop didn't blow up out of there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very. Because New Orleans got other sounds. I'm sure Atlanta got other sounds. You know, New York had other sounds, but like we had to speak about hip hop. And I always wonder if those sounds weren't some type of subgenre of hip hop anyway, because some of the go-go music is derived from R and B songs, and go-go has been, you know, I don't man, people in DC gonna kill me. I don't know how old go-go is. I would guess early '80s, late '70s. But okay, but I'm, I, you know, yeah, no, it's just always been surprising. It's, to me. it's not prominent enough. We don't have like the 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 audience isn't there for the local homegrown artists enough for them to have the city on lock and garner attention from across the country. And then Go-Go is so specific to DC, it can be an acquired taste for some because it's yeah. so heavily percussive yeah. that once it leaves DC and it's unfamiliar to ears, they're probably not going to adopt it the same way. You listen to Memphis rap, you listen to a Yo Gotti or a Glorilla, like that bounce in they flow, yeah, yeah. that translates everywhere. You can yeah, bounce yeah. to that in Brooklyn. Yeah, for sure. But Go-Go is so percussive and they shout out neighborhoods in DC who you ain't never heard of if you're not from there. It's just a different, um, the gap, the relatability is wider for huh. the larger national audience. Can At least sp- that's what I think. Can you spit a rhyme? Come on, bro. Just ask him. No. You, <laughs> you said you used to rhyme. Can you spit a rhyme? Uh, you want to know, man, I always dreaded somebody asking me that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do it. Oh, you should definitely do it. Nah. There's not even a beat, so we're not All even right. judging, like, you know. All right. Ah, oh, damn. It don't have to be a whole 16. Watch I open my eyes and you're still looking at me. <laughs> damn, <all right>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, If I do it, I got to give you disclaimers. I think the last rap I wrote was about 21. That's okay. Uh, all right. Damn. Okay. Damn, thought I buried this body. <laughs> Smelling up the backyard. Like Virginia Beach is killing the hip hop scene. Yo, Virginia Beach has a specific sound of it. Was it like the seven amazing. cities? Why are we whispering? Like the seven cities, like I'm Norfolk. Th- I'm letting you think. Well, I'm giving you, I'm like, Yo, Virginia right. Beach is murder, is a very important hip hop area. 
And then DC, DC is bad close. It's not it, maybe proximity wise in terms of miles, but culture nowhere close. For sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. But yeah. I'm like, why didn't it bleed over? The niggas in Virginia Beach who are getting wrecked. No, no cultural DC. overlap. Virginia Beach can survive on their own. No seven cities down there. They got a culture. They mob deep. They got great athletes. Yeah. Like the yeah. Norfolk, Suffolk, Virginia Beach, all those, like those cities, they roll tight, man. And they 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 have a very specific culture that DC does not share. All right. So I wrote this joint when I was working as a receptionist. It's called God Passed Me to Rock. All right. I think it's like 32 bars, so stick with me. Okay, come on. All right. Let me think. All right, it go like this. God passed me the rock. It's up to me to make the play of the game and shoot the three before the buzz of the clock. Believe it or not, I got cocky half ass in my rhymes just to see if rap levels a flock. It didn't get me a lot. Just a whole bunch of ass kissing critics screaming how they still think that I'm hot. And when my album gonna drop, it's gonna take the rap market by storm. And I'm thinking that's a wonderful plot, but homie, what if it flop? I can't be 32 still flipping cheeseburgers at the jack in the box. It's a wonderful start when you 18 like I am now and you got a lot of fans on your jock. So don't compare me to Pac, Big L, Biggie, Jehovah, Weezy, or 50, Eminem, Nas, Face of the Locks. Now nah, look at my slot. I'm dead last at the bottom of the burrow and I'm trying to climb my way to the top. I'm still trying to start a forest fire with my music that I like the whole world if you give it a shot. Right now it's a spark that's hot enough to burn the hands of a greedy nigga thinking he gonna get what I got. Oh, people will mock your rap style till they find out you so fucking fly you make gravity stop. Then they a cop your album so quick, it don't even make it to the store, it's on sell at the dock. That'll come as a shock, but that's a long way away. So until that great day when I'm climbing the charts and they read it and weep, I gotta go through unbelievable beef. Name my habitat as mean as the streets, that's why I'm making my mark. I'ma etch my rap name in the block, I'm permanent and yours is written in chalk. All I need is a mop and I can wipe your slate clean, so just ask how, how when I tell you to hop. I could have it on lock, they don't care. I could win 12 Grammys and 15 image awards. Let somebody get shot up in the club when they singing my song. Now I'm the source of everything that is wrong. But this country is not what we advertise. Half of us are walking around daily with our stomachs and knots. Just invest in my stock because my supersonic jazz and make bucks. I'll be king with the eyes of a hawk. God passed me the rock. I was 18 when I wrote Woo! that joint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was fire, man. The rap style was so different back then because it was about analogies and being clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now it's just about alliteration and how your voice is an extension of the beat. Like yeah. the Gunners and the Young Thugs of the yeah. world, they found a way to manipulate their voices. It's almost like an instrument. Yeah. So what they're saying falls secondary to the way that they're saying it. Rap's completely changed in that way. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I can't believe you got that out of me, bro. Ah, <laughs> for sure. For I've sure. never done that before. Never doing it again. I but appreciate it. It used I to be such a big part of my life, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You miss it? Nah. Nah, I got kids and shit, man. I got stuff to fill up them boys. <laughs> I got responsibilities. I, you know, I feel like I grew up, I remember hearing Rapper's Delight on the radio. So I saw hip hop from Ooh. a baby. That's right? crazy. I remember my father's friend saying, yo, have you heard the message? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like 10, I don't know what you're talking about. And went and heard the record. I'm like, yo, that's amazing. I have always been in love with the, the way the MC relates to the track mm. and the flow. And even if I don't understand what you're saying the first time through the song, if the flow is the shit, and I will listen again and again and again. No doubt. To figure out what you're saying. And I think from the beginning, it was always like that relationship of flow to the beat is the thing that freaking pulls me in. And I can't, I can't get away from that. You know, nothing is more important than that relationship. If you don't have a good flow to the beat, I can't hear you. No. I can't hear you. Because you if if there isn't a good flow. Then you might as well be doing poetry. If yeah. if it's only yeah. Yeah. if it's going to be distilled down to just the words you're saying, yeah. then you can do spoken word. Yeah. But to put it to a beat and to make those things flow together and to paint a picture in my head with all those different elements, that's why I love music, man. That's why I love music. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. This is fantastic. This is this appreciate is dope. you. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you, you for brother. Sure, for sure. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe you got me to. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, what we do. Good times. That's man. what we do. Thank you, brother. 
Hey, if you like what you saw today, be sure to check out more Torre Show content right here. Don't forget to click that subscribe button for more Torre Show content every week.